So, uh, chapter 52, in chapter 51 we talked about uh, individual ecology, essentially, behavior. Now we're going to talk about the behavior of populations, essentially. Uh, remember that a population, a population is uh, the study of populations in relationship to their environment. Okay, uh, environmental influences on density, age structure, and population size. And um, a reminder then that a group, a population, is a group of individuals of a single species. Whoops, uh, sorry about that. Of a single species that live in a given area. Okay, so that's what a population is. And so uh, populations, uh, density then, is how many in the populations you have in an area. Okay, how many organisms you have in an area. So there are three ways that organisms are dispersed then. There's clump dispersion where they live in packs. There's uniform dispersion like these penguins and then things like dandelions and stuff uh, randomly dispersed. And I'll let you think about this. A good thought thing here is what are humans? Which one would humans fit into? Uh, a life table then is a way to show what happens to a population. Okay, and they use the term, a term you should know, maybe not for this year, but for future, is cohort. A cohort would be a birth year. Okay, the gr a group, a cohort of anything that you follow, maybe humans, would be like all the fifth graders, for example, would be a cohort. And in education, we follow a cohort. Um, so, uh, a life table, I'm in trouble here, looks like this. Okay, where... You put uh, the number alive at the start of the year, obviously, 337 squirrels were born this year, 207 of them died, that's a 61% death rate. Okay, and then, so, um, uh, the asterisks here, uh, this says 252, but they captured one-year-olds, and so that's the difference, why you got the difference in numbers between 337 here and 207 and then 252, and then you can trace them. Okay, there are 252 here, 127 left here, 67, 35, 19, 5. And you can see that one, your chance of surviving to be 10 years old or in the 9 to 10 year old bracket, if you're a female, is about 2% or 2 tenths of a percent. If you're a male, zero. Males and belly and ground squirrels only live. Uh, so that tells you some interesting stuff about ground squirrels just by looking at a life table. Uh, survivorship curve is another way to show uh, the data in a life table. And I'm going to skip. Uh, this is what that would look like for females and males. But if you look at, there are three types of survivorship curves that you should know. There's the human survivorship curve, where most or most humans live and then die at a rapid rate. At 80% at of the maximum lifespan, 80% of the humans are alive yet. Whereas the squirrels, the belly and ground squirrels do pretty much a straight line down. They're dying at about the same rate, about the same rate, every year. Something like an oyster, you get a, a curve like this, where a very few organisms live a very long time. The maximum lifespan is a very few organisms live to the maximum. Most die very quickly. Okay, and again, it's helpful to think of other organisms that have this kind of survivorship curve. So then we have to talk about life history traits. What does what is an organism's life history help tell you about how they act? Okay, and this evolu like it says there, evolutionary outcomes. Uh, there are two basic kinds of life history. Uh, my favorite is semoparity. <laughs> I love this big bang reproduction. Uh, yeah, uh, reproduce once and die. Then you have iteroparity, repeated reproduction. So uh, obviously, humans fit iteroparity, okay? I know there's a joke in there, but we're not going to say it right now. And semoparity would be something like a, a mayfly, okay, that reproduces and dies. Uh, here's an example with birds. I think this is interesting about life history. When they took birds and they reduced the amount of eggs, this is the number of parents surviving the following winter in percent. When the birds had a reduced brood size, in other words, let's say the normal brood size was five eggs, and they had 
four or less eggs, that 100% of the females survive the following winter and 90, almost 90% 90 of the males. In a normal brood size, you got just over 50% of bulls surviving the winter. And when you had an enlarged brood size, six or greater, less than 50% survived the following winter, which is really an interesting thing to look at, where if you think about that, why that is, is because, of course, this requires a lot more energy. This requires a lot of energy, but you don't spread your... This requires a lot less energy, but you don't spread your genes as much. So here we are in the perfect, if you will, category where you produce enough offspring to survive, and yet you have a better than 50% chance of surviving also. Uh, here's a dandelion. Uh, again, grows quickly, produces a large number of seeds. And then you have something like this coconut palm that produces very large seeds, but a, very, a small number. Okay, and so two different ways to reproduce and pass on your offspring. So we need to look at uh, population growth then. What makes a population grow? And there are two basic kinds of reproduction. We're going to ignore immigration and emigration in a population. Just talk about a population's growth rate. Birth rate minus death rate, essentially. Okay, if birth rate equals death rate, you have zero population growth. And here we're going to talk about a little calculus. Okay, the differential of n with respect to t equals r to n or r times n. And so if we look at this, n would be the population number, and r is a multiplier that talks about how fast the population is growing. We call this exponential growth. If organisms were just left alone, on their own, with no predation, none of that, you would get exponential growth in every organism. For example, uh, look at the elephant population growth from the year 1900 to the year 19 about 70, okay, when they were just left alone and they were not able to be hunted or anything, exponential growth of the population. The thing is that that model doesn't work very long in any population. The more realistic model is called the logistic growth model because we have to talk about carrying capacity, and many of you remember this from Biology 1. We did it in the beginning of the year. Okay, carrying capacity is labeled K. Okay, K, and that's an important idea. So, I'm going to skip this slide. So, here's the uh, calculus equation if you really need to know it, which, if you really want to know it, which you don't. But what a uh, K structure looks like this this is exponential growth, this is logistic growth, or reaching carrying capacity where it reaches a certain number, which we call K, say 1,500 is the amount of organisms that the population can support. We'll talk about why that is in a little bit. So, for example, a paramecium population in the lab shows K logistic growth. Here's the population of Daphne, and I'm not sure why they didn't trace this. Exponential growth at first, then it drops off to a certain number. Here's the population of uh, sparrows in their natural habitat. Okay, notice there's a very wide disparity, but you can kind of find a growth number in there. So, there are two life history traits we have to talk about. K selection or density dependent selection. Selects for life, this is something you really need to know. Selects for life history traits that, traits that are sensitive to population density. In other words, that it matters how many how many organisms there are in the area. Our selection is called density independent selection. Selects for life history traits that maximize reproduction. In other words, how are you going to have as many babies as you can in a short period of time? That's our selection. K selection is that something that's sensitive to population density. So then let's talk about the questions then. What is it that keeps the population from growing? And why is it that some populations show all these incredible up and down like the song sparrow and others kind of remain stable? In density independent or R selection populations, birth rate and death rate don't change with population density. It doesn't matter how many organisms there are. 
The birth rate and the death rate doesn't matter, doesn't seem to matter how many are living in the area. In K selection, birth rates fall and death rates rise with greater, this should say greater population density. And here's why. Okay, so this is a view of the same idea. Okay, so uh, what affects density-dependent birth and death rates? What affects this? Well, here are some factors. Competition for resources, territoriality, health, predation, waste, and other things. Okay, let's look at some examples of those. Competition for resources. What do organisms compete for? As you have more population, you compete for things like space, food, water, if you're a plant, light. Those are the resources that you compete for. That can limit a population. So here's a plantain. As you have a greater population density, they produce less seeds. That's K selection, life history trait. Here's a song sparrow. Okay, as density increases, that means less food, birth rate declines. Clutch size declines, and clutch size would be how many eggs you produce. Territoriality. So if you're a vertebrate, you have a territory that can limit population density. Okay, so if you have your space and this one has its space and you don't want to cross, that means you're going to have less organisms in here. Uh, health. Uh, in what this means is basically disease, both parasites, parasitic disease, and viral and bacterial disease, the greater the population density, look what happens in school, right? You can be healthy all summer, get to school and get sick, right? That drives down the health. If you drive down the health, you have less reproduction. I'm not saying we'll have less reproduction in school or more reproduction in school. What I'm saying is that as the population gets dense, it's easier to spread pathogens. Of course, as prey population grows, predators can feed on them. And so you see what happened here is that we have predation on the, on the moose and Isle Royal. Here was a severe weather. That would be density independent selection. Okay, it didn't matter how many there were. The winter was severe winter weather and food and food, but this is a predator population that's done this in the uh, in the moose. Again, commercial catch of crabs. Who's doing the commercial catching? Predators, humans. Here's an interesting graph showing the snow sh the hare population in thousands, the black, and the lynx population uh, in thousands, and look how closely they. They mirror each other. That as the hare population grows, the lynx population grows soon after. Hare population drops, lynx population drops. Hare population rises, soon after the lynx population rises. Here's an example. This is a human population curve. Okay, notice in about 13 to 1400 AD, and this may actually be not low enough. Some historians think that that should be a lot lower. There's this incredible drop in the human population. Since then, we've had an incredible rise in the human population. So, uh, and you see that the human population growth is actually somewhere up in here, and still going, uh, with no real relief in sight. Um, why? Well, none of those factors we talked about apply to humans. We're not very territorial. If we are, we build more stuff away from each other. We're not, don't have any predators. We've gotten rid of pathogens pretty much right there. You know, and we don't, our competition for, what about competition for resources? Well, think about what we've done. Agriculture has eliminated that. We just started selling it to everybody else and giving it away. So, uh, yeah, human population is undergoing exponential growth as we speak. What happens to it in the future, we'll see. There's one other way to look at uh, human growth, and this is uh, another way to show population growth.
cocaine in a place like Afghanistan, which is in very rapid growth, birth rate much higher than death rate. Look at this. 16%, greater than 16% of their population is between 0 and 4 years old. And if you take that out to this one, plus 14, 30% of their population, almost one in every three people is under 10 years old. That's pretty crazy. United States is slow. It's kind of growing slowly. There's quite a few people still at birth in age, less people at older age. And then you look somewhere like Italy, where the population is actually going down. Okay, there's still quite a few people here at uh, childbearing age, but the number of people that these are the people that I would say could die any time. These are the people that have just been born. This is much smaller than that. So that's a look at just life history traits, population, ecology.